Hello, everyone. We're back on the aptly named Student Media Podcast for episode two of season two. I'm your co-host, Deacon Tuttle, joined with... I'm Evan Couch, and we are here with The Observer's new editor-in-chief for this quarter, Catherine Kamarada, Kamatara. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to say your last name. I kind of wish it was Kamatara now that you say Kamatara. that. Kamatara. <laughs> I just gave you a new name. How does that make you feel? Kamatara. Kamatara. <laughs> Yeah. Good. Thank you for having yeah. me. Appreciate of course. It. It's great for you to be here. It's uh, we've got a lot of good questions for you. Like we were just talking about, it's different being on the other side of the questions, right? I mean, as the editor in chief, you ask a lot of questions because that is pretty much your job. You go out, you interview, you you make sure everyone's doing their job to do the paper and whatnot. How does it feel to be on the other side of the questions? It feels interesting. You know, it's cool to just see kind of what I'm putting people through in some capacity and what they're feeling and feeling a little bit of what the people that I interview get to experience is an interesting thing to do. And it's fun that we get to collaborate with multiple different student media organizations. I'm really happy about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, again, congratulations on being the new editor in chief and for the first two issues of The Observer. Um, how's your time been so far and how's that transition been? It's been great so far. I feel like I have a great editorial staff that I'm working with. We've got Evan in the building. <laughs> and, uh, we've got, you know, a great group of editors to work with. We had a little bit of a hiccup at the beginning where our designer quit like the first day. So now we are training two new graphic designers and they're doing it. They're putting themselves right out there and getting on top of things and we're getting them up to speed on everything they need to know. So I think we're pulling it off. It's going great so far. I love what we covered in our first issue. I'm look at I'm that. Yep. Look, look at that. that. Front page, you star, Evan. And oh. I'm excited <laughs> to the second issue as well. You know, I think we've just got a great group of heads on our shoulders, so to speak. We've got great ideas for stories and we're just gonna keep the momentum going. Awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. What's like one main celebration you want to shout out so far? And then something you're looking to improve as the quarter goes on. I think just the design team getting together and making the first and second issue happen is something to for sure celebrate since they're brand new at it. They've had no training yeah. prior to this first issue. And just um, the coverage that we got to include and the fact that we've done two 12 page papers in a row, you know, last quarter, it was a lot of eight page papers, no big deal, no problem. I think it's mm -hmm. nice to be able to fine tune a shorter paper like that, an eight page paper. But I think it's really cool that this coming issue, the second issue, we are including every single story that was written by our staff. I'm really proud of that. I'm really excited that no one's being excluded. You know, it's not a, a big deal when things have to be cut when you're editing or when you're choosing what makes the final cut. But it's to me, it's cool when we can have all of our new reporters, all these new voices be heard. So I'm excited about that. And it's got to be pretty it's got to be pretty uplifting for them too. you know, to see that their work is actually being not necessarily appreciated, but it's being recognized, you know, because you could say it goes both ways. It's being appreciated and it's being recognized. And we're showing that their hard work is paying off by putting it in the paper and whatnot, which is you know, something that's pretty gratifying, I think, about student media because it's student run. So every mm -hmm. student gets the opportunity to, to do it, even if you're not, you know, if you're not, you're not a journalism student, you're not working in media or anything like that. Like, Catherine, you're not a journalism student, are you? Absolutely. I agree with what you said. And I'm not a journalism student. I just declared a minor recently, but I didn't start as a journalism student. I just was interested in the class. I had taken journalism classes in high school, but it had been a while since then. I'm actually 28. I'm an older journalism class student. And so I'm really excited to be doing journalism again, which is something that I really didn't have much experience with. We just throw everyone into it with no experience, basically. And we're like, make this work, make it happen and bring something to us, produce something and we'll help you turn it into something publishable. And I think that's a really cool collaborative experience that I've enjoyed, that I've really benefited from. And you know, anyone can do journalism. I feel like not everyone knows AP style right out the <laughs> gate or anything sure. like that. But I think anyone can learn it if they have a passion for writing and a passion for talking to people, connecting with people and sharing their stories. And that's to me what drew me to it and made me think, you know, well, how can I combine my two majors as well, right? Because I have, or my multiple areas of study, I should say, because I have one major right now, psychology, and then two minors, journalism and philosophy. And so I like to try to combine those through things like my column, Breaking the Stigma, which is the very first thing that I ever pitched on staff last fall. It's, um, you know, a recurring column where I feature different voices from people who have have various different uh, mental disorders or conditions 
and I just try to focus on their quotes. It's a very quote heavy column, you know, and I talk to professionals like mental health care professionals in the area as well and ask them for their perspective on how to, to cope with these types of disorders. And then I ask uh, specifically one of my favorite questions I ask for that column is how, what do you wish more people knew about this disorder that don't have it? Because sometimes people who actually have the lived experience are going to have more to say than like a mental health care professional that just studied it, but they actually have no true practical experience with these things. So that's to me how I combined all of these different areas of study. And I think anyone can do that with any area of study, or you can write an opinion piece yeah. about like Jacqueline wrote about aviation or you've written about sports. And I feel like you can really combine outside interests with journalism. In fact, you might need to, right? To find cool angles or cool topics to talk about. I, I wanna know where does that passion come from for you know creating a whole nother part of the paper like breaking the stigma? Because in order to do something like that, you have to have you know like a deep feeling towards that kind of, you know, it can be a really heavy subject, the kind of things that you're talking about. You know, you're you're diving into someone's personal life with a lot of personal trauma or just things that they've overcome in their life. Where does that come from? Because that's not an easy thing to get into and not an easy thing to go out and ask people to write about and talk about. Yes, that's a great question. And I will I'll tap into that. I'll get as candid as you would like me to. Um, you know, I have my own lived experience with mental disorders. I've uh, have I'm diagnosed with bipolar disorder, ADHD, you know, I have other things that I feel like I qualify for uh, diagnostically that I don't necessarily have the official diagnosis for at this time. I honestly don't even relate to diagnoses that much personally, because I don't feel like it brings me help or health to think of myself in terms of a label like that, or to feel like I have to identify in a certain way. Like I, there's a lot of difference between saying I have bipolar disorder or I am bipolar. And so I just don't really identify with those diagnoses like that, but I do have that lived experience where I've dealt with a lot of symptoms. You know, there were times for years and years, that's why I'm in college and I'm like 28 right now is because I was kind of, I don't want to say behind in life by any means, because I don't want anyone else in my situation to feel that way. But I felt that way for a long time because I, because of symptoms that I had, you know, and um, just my ways of relating to people were not working for me. And so I was staying inside. I felt so ashamed I wouldn't leave my house for a great portion of my life, actually. And that's something that I've really been able to push past by joining things like The Observer, you know, by putting myself out there, by continuing my education later on in life and just allowing myself to live and allowing myself the grace to feel like just because things didn't go exactly in a cookie cutter way that everyone else's life went doesn't mean that my life's invalid or less, you know, less uh, successful in any way, you know, I'm just making, forging my own path, making my own path and trying to find things that really ignite that passion. And so that passion for me is found in looking at my own progress and looking at how I've healed through these symptoms that I've experienced and looking at how talking to people about that can help. People are super hungry to talk about this. Like people, at first I was like, will anyone want to talk to me about this beyond my friend that was in the first article about autism spectrum disorder? And people do want to talk about it. People do want to talk about it. I get most of my sources from social media. I just do an outreach post on stories a lot of the time. And I'm like, if you have this disorder and you want to talk about it for this column, reach out and DM us. And then I talk to people and sometimes people have really heavy stories and people get super candid with me. And I'm really grateful to them that they feel like they can open up in that regard with me. And sometimes I even relate to them in a way. And I say, you know, I've experienced this too. And maybe that's not necessarily the most objective approach to an interview, but because the content matter is so personal and so hard to talk about, I think it's good to put yourself out there like that, to be as supportive as possible when you're interviewing people about things like suicide. Um, you know, right. this is, these are topics that people are going through all the time. And, you know, I've, I love my sources, to be honest, like I genuinely have a deep love for the people that I've talked to for this column. And if they ever uh, see me out and about, it's cool to like actually get to connect with them in person. I've, uh, you know, I've met a few people in person. I do most of my interviews via the phone. That's just how I work best. And, you know, I, I, I forget what the question was, but you know, I'm, I'm riffing on it. What are we talking about again? Well, you, do you feel like, cause it's kind of a double, it's like a double it's like a double edge in a good way that, you know, you're breaking the stigma, you're, you're shedding light and you're shining information on, on these things and these really dark and often heavy topics, like you said, um, to kind of bring it to the public. So they know what's going on. You know, they, they have an understanding of what people go through every single day, but at the same time, is it 
more of a thing where you feel like you're helping the person you're talking to as well, instead of just informing the public and informing the people who read the paper? I would say I don't want to claim that I'm even able to help the people that I talk to, right. but I think that giving them an outlet and a space and a holding space for them, so to speak, so that they can just honestly and authentically share just with no reservations. I think, and then the questions that I ask, you know, these questions I ask, um, you know, what what do you wish more people knew about the disorder? What What is this experience like for you? And, uh, you know, I just get deeper into the experience in a way that maybe they haven't been able to talk to anyone but a therapist about. And I think that just helps them process for themselves. Like I, maybe I'm doing some amount of processing with them because I do feel things deeply when people are telling me these things, but that doesn't mean that I'm, I don't, I'm not qualified to help them, but I am happy that I can reflect with them mm -hmm. and they can reflect with me and let me know more about them and share that little piece of themselves with me that maybe they feel like is hidden away. Like in many settings, especially professional or academic settings, there is that stigma still. You know, I heard um, just like a side tangent, a little tiny point. I was walking through the hallway. Someone was reading our paper last quarter and they were like breaking the stigma. There is no stigma. And <sighs> it made me think, you know, maybe you've never been in the professional or academic setting where there might be a stigma, but there's still that here, even if it's being broken down consistently nowadays compared to like 10 years ago, there's still that fear that you're going to be discredited or devalued in your work because you are not able, people will see you as, you know, crazy or like you're not able to perform to the same level that someone who is neurotypical versus neurodivergent. And, you know, that's just not always the case. You know, even I was concerned about um, being candid about my own mental health issues in, in the observer, not because I didn't trust the people around me or Jen, but because I didn't know if that would somehow make me lose credibility in this workspace or make it seem like I couldn't handle things that people who are neurotypical can. And that's just something that we need to continue to break down and continue to share resources about. Because even if it's just helping one person to read the article or to be interviewed, like I feel like my mission is accomplished. Like I feel like I've done what I set out to do there and I just wanna keep doing it. Yeah, that's really awesome. First of all, I just want to say thank you very much for opening up and sharing those parts about yourself. I think that's really, that shows a lot. Um, and I think it's really cool that this platform is now able to be out there and that people are excited and like encouraged to, to share in that. So that's really cool. And hopefully going forward, it continues. It's awesome. Thanks, Deacon. Yeah. Appreciate that. Well, is there anything else that you're looking to add or modify or kind of change around as you're now the editor in chief this coming quarter? This is kind of random, but I just thought Beyond Bear coverage needed some mountains. <laughs> oh, coverage mountains, right? It's like I get it. I get it. We're going beyond. We're That's going good. beyond. I like that. Evan's picking up what I'm putting down, and I'm you know, glad. I did not realize that till you just brought that up, which is ironic. But now you're good. <laughs> now you're on board. I get it now. So. And then there's a letter from the editor, and I'm actually going to do that most issues, and I'll be highlighting. Uh, various stories throughout the issue and what page you can flip to for those. And I also would just want to have kind of prompts or questions for people to have on their mind, like at the risk of sounding corny. I just want people to believe in themselves and to know that they can push past any limitations they might be feeling. And I want to use my platform for that. I want to use any editorial space for that. And I love that we're doing an editorial column again, which was something mm -hmm. that was done in past years that Jen had mentioned to me. And now we're going to do it every now and then every, um, every either second or third week, we're gonna do an editorial column. This first one in the first issue was about the, the killing of Masa Amini by the Iranian morality police um, for not wearing her hijab properly. And I just feel like it's our responsibility to speak on topics that have to do with freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Like we're allowed to say whatever we want in this country as journalists. We can literally write an opinion piece about a sandwich like our wonderful editor mm -hmm. Morgana did. And you know, and we can say whatever we want to say. We can literally like roast our government. And then I wrote a piece that was like, was about that right now. Our involvement yeah. is a crime against humanity because it is. And so it, it, the ability to do that is a privilege that we absolutely should not take for granted. And I just think that the editorial column, maybe it won't always be serious, right? But I like that we can tie in world issues with local issues because women's bodily autonomy is still at risk here. So it's not just you know, freedoms of women in other countries that's being jeopardized. It's freedom on our own home soil is surprisingly in this day and age still being jeopardized. And so it's good to be able to speak on that as someone who is a woman or, you know, I, I use multiple pronouns, but I, I'm more of like a fluid person, but in general, like I'm also, I have been a woman for the most of my life. And so 
that's something I still relate to. And that's something I want to keep speaking on if things like that continue to arise in the news. But I also might use that column at least one third of the time for satire because it's too much to be just constantly looking at what's going wrong in the world, looking at every social injustice and looking at the fact that us as the little people, so to speak, don't really have tons of power at any given moment to change it. We have our voices, we can protest like so many people have been. We do at the courthouse sometimes and then uh, students do when things, uh, people like Tiny Heartbeat Ministries come to campus. We can protest, we can write. And that's one of the biggest things we can do. We can donate to organizations who are working towards things that we want to see in the world. But, um, sorry, I kind of forgot <laughs> mid-sentence what I was talking about. You know, that happens sometimes. But back to the, you know, the satire column is what I was kind of at first getting at is going to be a way to kind of just look at things humorously and not have to be so sad all the time about maybe the lack of power that we feel even if we can do things like protest or write you know there's still things that we can't control we can't just change things like that even if we want to and so laughing about things is the best way to get past that at least for me i you know i use humor as a release in that way like i wrote a satire piece back last fall i believe that was about a duck family it says local family of ducks start gofundme to pay for migration <laughs> nice. about the Weber family. Do, um, you, do you think that like adding you know a, a sense of a, hu a sense of humor to you know news nowadays does it make it easier for people to consume because I personally do you know I I make it known that I you know I don't I don't get into politics I don't get into I don't get heavy into news just because everything you see is so negative mm -hmm. and it's so hard to to pay attention and to to finally and it will just to generally find interest in in what you're reading or what people are telling us because it's so dry because that's how it's supposed to be you know and as yeah. as a news editor i have to tell our reporters that because that's the way it is you know that's like we it, that's news that's what we do but at the same time wouldn't you want to find a way to make it more consumable and make it you know a little more oriented to people who are our age or people who are who want to find an easier way to consume just really hard information that is really all around us nowadays. That's what I think is so cool about editorials because you can kind of bring news into it, but you can put your own spin on it or you can use humor or you can use whatever, whatever you want in it. And that's why I do like a good colorful lead or some creativity, creative writing in scene stories. It doesn't so much fit in news. I got sorted into news, which was my second pick back in fall of 2021. And I was like, what? So I have to write boring stories now. <laughs> Star was my editor. She was like, "Yeah, I, I guess. Like that's kind of yeah. the the shtick of news." And so I do like seeing a little better myself for that reason because you can be more creative and try to like draw people in. But you know, I think there's different interesting ways to push the boundaries, or you can cover things and maybe make connections between things that are news like. But I think editorial is the best space to bring that intrigue in that people are maybe going to find more interest in reading. Yeah, I mean. Mm -hmm. It, it like you know it's it's back and forth because I uh, like I said I'm the same way it's just like news yeah it's great you know I've try I'm trying so much harder to learn more about news and consume more news but it's just tough you know when you're a person like me who just doesn't take a whole lot of interest to it to consume news when it's just so clean cut to the bone so dry it's it's hard to do but it's just the way it is right now and I think I think we at Observer and just other news outlets can find, you know, some pretty clever ways to do it, but also, you know, to to stay stay in a way, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, know I'm drawing a blank here. I lost myself too. It's okay. Okay. Well, yeah. one thing that I like that you, it seems like both of you guys have touched Darn. on is the like how personable you guys are trying to be through it and like adding in sections that like interact with with the with the reader itself or like just making it everyone's voice be known on the observer which is really cool to me i think that probably helps break it down a little bit more to where it's more fun yeah i yeah i'm really happy with the staff that we have right now i can see great things happening for us and i'm all about uniting us and trying to and i want to do more of this in class than i've been able to because we're just trying to teach so much at the beginning of a fall quarter yeah it can be hard to like do fun things but i want to do more 
team building with our team or like go to the Japanese garden and do the critiques there tomorrow is actually what I'm thinking for class could be fun you know and just well don't um, worry I mean we're in October but we're gonna have 80 degree weather for the rest of the week so you might as well enjoy it while it lasts I know right we got to advantage and it's not windy of all things you'd think it might be windy see back to what we were talking about if that's okay can I go back to the thing about Absol music absolutely I totally agree with that it can be I think it gets to be really interesting when you're like breaking a story or, or if you find a story that hasn't been covered and with the angle that you want to cover it if you find a story that hasn't just hasn't yet spread all over campus like uh am I allowed to talk about what's coming out in issue two Ooh, yeah issue, issue two is out already as of this recording issue two you're is right. out Go check it Not out yet, yeah. on newsstands near you. It might be today, it might be tomorrow. Go find that. And, and if you can't find it in a newsstand somewhere because it's so good and everyone picked it up and is reading it and they're all gone, uh, you go to cwobserver.com. Yes. Absolutely. Plug. Absolutely. So there is a shooting that happened at UW a few days ago. And it seemed like not a lot of people had heard about it. Like I went to interview. I had not heard about it. Campus police. They hadn't heard about it like not everyone had heard about it right away surprisingly so that's something that can be you know it was just a news story it's just a plain news story and i got to interview someone from campus police and he was amazing and very helpful and able to interview on the spot and you know um investigative stories can also get really interesting like yeah, the budget yeah. story maybe that would be a dry story but the fact that no one was willing to talk about it the administration was saying a bunch of different things to different people and then the faculty was hearing all of this stuff hearing from department chairs department heads that they should maybe look for other work you know and then the fact that i don't really know that i'm ever going to be able to follow up in a way that i feel satisfied with because there's no real way to prove whether someone got fired be, or like let go or whatever reason that they left for. There's no way to prove that. No one's gonna wanna talk about that. And so right. it's kind of just been swept under the rug but it's like the budget went down slightly but did we lose professors as a result of it? I can't really speak to that but I know that there's a professor that wasn't tenured that was in a department that I'm in that's no longer there. And I don't know why, and I don't know how I'm going to find out why, you know, maybe I could go hunting for that. But that could be, that's an interesting way to approach news sometimes. If you feel like there's something that's just not being said, that is being said, or like Lainey's amazing story about the dining services um, um, supervisor, you know, I'm really impressed that she went down that path. And there's so many like moral questions that come into play there, but our role is to be objective and unbiased. And so even if, even despite how we might feel about what we're covering, it's important to cover it anyways and if we uncover things it's important to put that out into the open 100 agree and yeah i couldn't agree more um you know as we always do on this show now it's going to be a recurring segment it's time to feel the pulse this is where we bring in questions from our listeners or people who just have general interest in the podcast and we've got two questions for you specifically feel from yes our feel yes the pulse. This, this is when we're going to add in some cool stuff and effects that you can't see right now. Okay. But, um, so the first question that comes for you from our listeners, uh, are you excited with your editor role? And obviously we kind of talked about that a little bit, but you can dive into that a little more. Like what, what was that, you know, what was that initial feeling and what was that initial feeling? And then what's the feeling now from, from that whole process? Do you know what's interesting is Jen recently told me that I used the word excited too many times in one of my articles. And I think I used it like five times at the beginning of this interview, at least. And I definitely am an excited person in general. I try to stay, you know, loving whatever I'm doing and committing to whatever I'm doing, even if it's not the same as what I'm going to do next year. Like, I just try to stay happy with where I'm at in life. And it's, of course, it's a giant honor. Like, I've never even been in a manager position. I really haven't put myself out there in this way publicly publishing my work, even though I've been a writer for a while. And so just to be able to be a part of something like this where I am publishing consistently, that in and of itself is an honor. And then to be in a more of a leadership position where I get to do more copy editing. I'm really big into copy editing. I'm a big fan of like great grammar and punctuation. <laughs> Good. I'm into it on a spiritual level. And so being able to make sure that things look as good as they possibly can for the paper is something that I really appreciate. Plus my amazing editorial staff and that like just the group of us that decided to come back this year, I think it's awesome that we all decided to stick around and to commit to this project and to make it the best that we can and to all put our voices into it and our opinions into it. And we all have different ways of seeing things. And you know, there are ups and downs to that, but I think that in the end we come together and we find a way 
to make the best of all the different worlds and viewpoints that we have on our staff. And I'm just, I'm just grateful for that. I'm grateful for that opportunity to, to share with the world. And the fact that now I can write letters from the editor, I'm going to use that to speak on things that I think are important. And so that's important to me. Yeah, it, it truly is a team effort. I mean, it's kind of all there is to it. People kind of just see the, see the paper or see the article and they, they think, well, you know, it's an article, someone wrote that, but it's a very, it's, cool. a, it's a very collaborative experience when putting together a paper, like they wouldn't even understand. We could go into that for hours. I mean, the design nights last hours. So yeah, it's, just, it's, last night. it's part yeah. of it, you know, it's part of it. Just checking the documents, making sure everything is looking good and still somehow missing things here and there but you know. I, yeah I missed something I really did I missed a handful of things I always go back right after submitting the pages because you know after you submit the pages and you don't want to do it too late in the night because you don't want to overwork your entire staff forever into the evening and then uh, I go back and look at the pages and obsessively find all the mistakes we didn't find before bringing it to publish uh, or putting it to print and so there, there's some stuff that slips through the cracks, but I think we'll keep finding a better groove and a better flow with our uh, publication schedule throughout the quarter. We'll be able to find more and more of that without it being so much uh, able to slip through. That's what Jen's for. Jen will find it right away. She's good at that. <laughs> She'll let us know what's on her mind. Oh, I appreciate I know. It's that. good. Honestly. It's good. We need that. We do, right? We can't have yes men around all the time. Like I appreciate when people are willing to just be like, oh, this I didn't like this, but this is why, as long as you have a reason, like if you're telling me you don't like something and there's not a valid reason, I have a hard time with that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the staff usually has a valid reason and then they bring that to the table and then we're allowed to talk about it at that point. And I think that's great. Yeah, that's good. Rationalization is important. Uh, okay. The second question is, what is the best part about creating the paper? Ooh. If you had to pick one, one <laughs> thing, what is the number one thing that you like about creating a paper every single week? I love the people that I get to work with, the connections that I've made, the friends that I've made. Jampa, I interviewed him and I yep. wrote an article called, called The Many Lives of Jampa George. And we've since planned uh, multiple poetry events here in town together. And he's one of my best friends. And so, you know, I've made really great friends through the interviews that I've had. And I've shown myself uh, what I'm capable of, to be honest, because I didn't, I wasn't like a journalist before this. I had done like one year or like a year and a half of journalism before I dropped out of high school. So, you know, I I had not had this experience before. And so this is all new to me and it's exciting in that way. And of course there are begrudging parts or there are times when I get very frustrated or feel like, what am I doing? Does this even matter? Does anything that I'm doing matter right now? Or is it just gonna fall on deaf ears? Or are people just gonna like throw it on the floor? Whatever happens with the observer, I don't know, but it, I'm just grateful that I can make the connections that I'm making and that I can put myself out there in a way that I have not yet done before. So that is what I like the most. Sweet. Like I said, collaborative team effort, you know, and it goes to show that you like your answer was surprising simply because you you mentioned that it's not just the people that you work with every single week. It's the people that you've actually met doing interviews that you're becoming close with as well, not just the people that you're working with, which I find to be really crazy because I've done quite a few interviews and I can personally tell you I've never hung out with any of those people outside of the interview so same here you got me beat yeah. in that category and now I'm th questioning about how I do my job so no don't question <laughs> like you're doing it in a more journalistic way like I but I'm picking topics that I'm so passionate about right and I end up just really connecting with the sources that I meet and they're sort of topics that I've wanted to dive into or communities that I've wanted to be part of before and then I haven't uh, been able to be part of or haven't put myself out there to be part of but then I have an excuse to talk to these people to be honest and I'm like oh you know these are people that I would have become friends with outside of journalism but this is a perfect excuse to get my get dip my toe in and get myself involved and that's certainly the case with talking to different mental health care professionals who are yeah. breaking stigma and it's it's the case with a lot of the interviews that I conduct or like the Bergstock interviews. I'm part of the music scene myself, I perform. And so it was great to like connect with other performers on a deeper level by interviewing them. Right. The last question, we got three. Last question. This one is interesting because I know everyone's, gonna, this is for all of us. Okay. Uh, everyone's gonna have a different answer. What piece of media, it can be movies, televisions, books, news, articles, anything, poetry, you know, what piece of media would you say has influenced you the most, like who you are today and the things that you enjoy doing? Such a difficult question. Do you have I, 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 
yeah, you, you guys want to go first? Sure, I'll, I'll go for it. Uh, I can't do of all time, but within the last couple of years, I'll just say since I've been in college, I really highly recommend the show The Leftovers. It's like my go-to show to recommend to people. It came out mid, mid-2010s. mid um, It's starring Justin Thoreau, and it's made by Damon Lindelof, and it's about what happens when about 2% of the world population disappears. Um, so everyone has theories and um, and writings about what they think is happening, and I'll just leave it at that. It's like a mystery show. It's uh, it was made on HBO, so it's high production quality. You, you can't go wrong with um, HBO. It's just it really makes you think about life and like your connections with people. And it, I just like I binge watched that show in like five days, which I'm proud to say. Actually, I'm not <laughs> unproud to say that because it was that gripping. Um, How many seasons is that? It it's so there's. First season is 10 episodes, second season is two, and then seven episodes for the final one. Okay. So all about an hour long each. And it, it's a very heavy show, though. So I recommend, you know, taking some breaks. Maybe, you know, the, the binge probably wasn't the best thing, but I needed to know what happened. So it's it really just makes you think about things. And I, I appreciate a show that challenges, like, beliefs of yours or other people's, like, a lot and doesn't make it, um, doesn't paint anybody out as the bad guy tries to see all sides of an issue so well i know what new segment we're doing next we're going to do a check them out segment every single yeah. week where we bring a new piece of media to the table Ooh. that was great yeah um uh, mine is i've said it before it's it's kind of dumb but it's just true to who i am but uh pat mcafee he has a daily sports show that he does every single day on youtube um and well recently the radio but he cut the deal with them and he's basically just started from the ground up obviously he had a platform because he played in the nfl but just getting to see him every single day doing what he loves to do and working with a small group of people and his like really close friends and starting his own business and kind of helping them from the ground up and pretty much, you know, making them not rich, but giving them really good lives and, and doing what he does every single day, just getting to talk about sports and not getting told what to do by someone above him. You know, it's just, that's kind of what, not necessarily what I strive to do, but it's it's really inspiring because working in that sort of fashion, like how we have our podcast here, getting to do our own show, we're kind of in charge of everything. Yeah. We, you know, that's something that I realized I wanted to do, and that's the avenue that I want to take. So that's that's the big one for me. That's cool. I would love to see you write more sports stuff because you know that is what you're passionate about, and that's why I have a column myself. And I just think following your passions is so important. And in that vein, I would say one of my favorite pieces of media is a workbook by Julia Cameron called The Artist's Way, which is a guide to releasing creative blocks by going back, addressing past traumas in your childhood, and just ways that people made you feel less than for expressing yourself in the past, and then uh, breaking through that. And then uh, also one major exercise in it that I can't recommend enough to people is called Morning Pages. You wake up and you journal anything on your mind, completely no judgment, like literally anything, three pages every morning, religiously do that. And then you will be surprised what comes out. You know, for me, at least, I start working through all my own problems that way. And so it's really, really helpful. And then she has a lot of great other exercises in that book. So could not recommend that enough. So so you do that? Do you Do you do that every single day? Oh gosh, don't, don't ask me. No, I do okay when I'm doing well. And then there's plenty of times or there's even periods in my life where I just like can't get myself to do it for any reason. Yeah. We all deal with this. We really do. Yeah. But uh, when you can push past and when you can just find the discipline and the will to do it, even if you just start with one page and then eventually work up to three, just doing any amount of morning journaling, especially where it's just no format, anything you want to write, even if you're just like blah, blah, blah. Right. At first, like just let it out don't judge yourself you know let yourself feel what you're feeling and i do it when i can i need to do it more i didn't do it today so called out but yeah I'll, <laughs> i swear well Catherine, we cannot thank you enough for coming on and, and sharing just all the insight that you gave us today you know taking a look at what it's like with your position now and, and really what goes into the paper we talk about it a little bit here and there is there anything that you'd like to to add or anything you'd like to leave the people who are listening on with well, I want to say thank you to both of you as well, because what you're doing is great and getting different voices in and talking to them in a very like low key conversation type setting, but still with great, great questions that I enjoyed answering. Thank you for doing this. And uh, it's a show for everyone. It's for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to see what you come out with next. Who are you interviewing next? Oh, I can't reveal that Ooh. yet. Okay, never mind. Special you, guests coming up you're, next. You're, you're, in. Jump, you're jumping into your, your EIC ways and just... <laughs> You're flipping the script on us. Well, for readers, 
I just want you to know that just like my first letter from the editor said, you know, maybe there's something in your life you want to do, you want to pursue, and you feel like you can't do it, you feel like you're not capable. There are steps you can take to get yourself to that point. You have to find what is the first st small step that I can take to get to that point, and how can I allow myself to stop believing that it's impossible? Like, how can I truly see it for myself? And if you can just envision it and tap into the feeling that you're feeling while you're envisioning it, it's really, it can be hard to do, but if you put a practice towards that, you will find that you'll see some results, at least some amount of results from doing that. So that's what I would like to leave readers with. There you have it, guys. It's everything you need to know. I mean, we just kind of uncovered everything there is to know about you. I feel like definitely not. Bit. I think I think there's a lot more underneath the surface that we could get into, but we don't have time for that because we can't be here all day. True. So and the Zoom link literally will not allow us to do that. Yeah, I got I got to talk. Zoom. I got to talk to those guys at at Central about giving us an extended account again. They gave it to us for literally one episode because that's how long my slowness mm. took to actually get on it. This is good. You know, our podcast is almost like a like a TV medium and it's own sort because we have these mini narratives that we're kind of following. We got we've got uh, Evan occasionally screwing up names. When, you know, <laughs> it happens, you know. Uh, we got you know this whole studio debacle. We got constantly shouting out Terry Red Out. I don't know if she's ever seen any of these. Shout but, out Terry. Yep. We uh we're taking a first amendment with her um right now, which was kind of applicable to what we were talking about with the freedom of the press earlier. So pretty interesting class so far. For sure. Right. I'd like yeah. to take I think I need to at some yeah. point take something from her. So I'm excited yeah. for that. I still vouch for uh, changing the name to Evan and Deacon's couch or Deacon and Evan's couch because your last name is couch. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> that's funny. Wow, that's actually really good. We actually talked about putting a couch like my roommate tonight because we have a couch downstairs and we we're kind of looking at getting a different one. It's up in the air. It's a whole thing. But anyways, we're, I, I was name. thinking about moving that couch to right here where we could actually do the show from in here because, mm -hmm. you know, we don't need some big corporation running studio running our show. Yeah. We do our own show right here. True, like the Seahawks are sponsored and Wildcats and such. And the loggers. <laughs> Just a bunch hey, of sports. We're 5-0. and oh. five, Daring That's loggers are 5-0. and oh. I have a hand in that because I'm a coach. Not there currently, but I love those guys back home. Shout out to them. Shout out, man. Shout out, loggers. Go loggers. <laughs> We're playing the number one team in the state on Friday. So oh. we'll see how that goes. But yeah, Catherine, cannot thank yeah. you enough. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And yeah. um, look forward to more issues. And I look forward to working on those issues. And I'm sure Deacon looks forward to reading those issues. I have. I'm picking them up off the stands every week. It's true. He does. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for everything. Yeah. I hope you take care and have a good one. And I'm excited to watch the podcast and watch more of them in the future. Oh, sweet. You're gonna be so Thank sad you. whenever I butcher your name at the beginning. I'm sorry. Oh, never again. Aramada. That's my new oh. Alamada. Kam Kamatara. <laughs> Calamari. Kamatara. That's so much better. It sounds like av Avatar. Katana. <laughs> all right. Evan Couch Deacon. Catherine Katana signing off. Thanks, guys. <laughs>